Christians share a rich biblical foundation with our Jewish sisters and brothers. Our series, Foundations in Faith, explores that shared foundation. In our scripture today from Hebrews, we find the early church folk reflecting on the blessings of Abraham's faithfulness. When have you trusted in God when others thought you were foolish for doing so? Here now our scripture from Hebrews, chapter 11, verses 8 through 19. By an act of faith, Abraham said yes to God's call to travel, travel to an unknown place that would become his home. When he left, he had no idea where he was going. By an act of faith, he lived in the country promised him, lived as a stranger, camping in tents. Isaac and Jacob did the same, living under the same promise. Abraham did it by keeping his eye on an unseen city with real eternal foundations, the city designed and built by God. By faith, Baron Sarah was able to become pregnant, old woman as she was at the time, because she believed the one who made a promise would do what he said. That's how it happened, that from one man's dead and shriveled loins, there are now people numbering into the millions. Each one of these people of faith died not yet having, ha having, hand, having in hand what was promised, but still believing. How did they do it? They saw it way off in the distance, waved their greeting, and accepted the fact that they were transients in this world. People who live this way make it plain that they are looking for their true home. If they were homesick for the old country, they could have gone back any time they wanted, but they were after a far better country than that, heaven country. You can see why God is so proud of them and has a city waiting for them. By faith, Abraham, at the time of testing, offered Isaac back to God. Acting in faith, he was as ready to return the promised son, his only son, as he had been to receive him. And this, after he had already been told, your descendant shall come from Isaac. Abraham figured that if God wanted to, he could raise the dead. In a sense, that's what happened when he received Isaac back, alive from off the altar. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. A couple of months ago now, we started Foundations in Faith, and it is that focus on this birthday cake understanding of how we Christians, via the New Testament, stand on this rich heritage, and we share it particularly with our Jewish brothers and sisters, and it really forms the foundation uh, of who we are and um, the Torah first five books of the Bible, but particularly Genesis being the first, um, Exodus number two, tells us so much about who we are, about who God is, um, and about how we, um, how we interact with one another. Sometimes it's a, a wonderful celebration of something good, and oftentimes it is an um, explanation or a picture of what isn't as it should be. And <clears throat> so much of Genesis... Uh, even Exodus, Jesus' parables and, and, and many uh, pieces of scripture, they give us a story that allows us, if we need to, to just stay at a surface level, hear the story, and kind of go about our business without ever being challenged or strengthened in the faith. But all along, God is is trying to massage and shape and draw us down to the depths of what really moves and shapes us and this world. It's not obvious, like a, an iceberg isn't obvious until you understand that iceberg. And, and so in chapter 12 of Genesis, is where our scripture today starts with, uh, in Hebrews, of God calling Abraham and at that call with Abraham, we understand that Abraham is called, Abraham and Sarah are called to a special responsibility. And that responsibility is to be those persons of which 
kabillions come from, and our prime directive, the thing that we're focused on, is being a blessing. Helping people, by blessing them, connect with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And not just in a, uh, an acknowledgement sense, but in the fullness of what that, that means. That's not just an easy thing. That is our special responsibility, and so often we struggle, just as I think Abraham and Sarah have struggled, with holding it perhaps as a special privilege. And I would say that for most of the times when uh, as individuals or as groups we mess up as people of faith, it's tied in some way to special privilege rather than special responsibility. Just imagine or think for a minute if people who posted on Facebook understood the difference between special responsibility to bring a blessing or special privilege that brings something else. Just imagine if every person of faith that you saw in some sort of national or uh, beyond, you know, uh, family sort of things, as they were speaking about whatever it is that's going on, whatever it is that is troubling or, or otherwise, if they understood that difference between special responsibility and special privilege, how easy it is for those to get mixed up and for us to lose focus. And yet, the thing that comes back to us again and again and again is how God finds a way um, to stay connected. We've talked about this as what Abraham and Sarah are struggling with, particularly the one God. You know, they spent 70, 80 years in a culture and likely worshiping multiple gods when God plucks them out, puts them in a new place, says, eh, there's not multiple gods, there's just one, and it's me, and let's start this new thing. And then the whole focus of trusting God without hedging our bets is really upon us today with the story of the binding of Isaac. That's where we are in chapter 22. Uh, the third piece that's an ongoing struggle, desiring God, which for we people of faith means to become more and more Christ-like. And to be on that journey rather than to just be in relationship for what we can get out of God. It's an ongoing struggle. It's one that, that God doesn't say, as soon as you meet the bar, I'll be in relationship with you. But God says, wherever you are, I will be in relationship with you and I'll help you grow into this abundance and fullness that I've designed the whole enchilada for. So we're in chapter 22. And it starts off by saying some time ago, I mean some time later of what has gone before. And I want to encourage you to read the few chapters prior to the last, last Sunday we were in chapter 17 where Abraham and Sarah's names are changed and the covenant of circumcision happens. Um, after that, famous story of the three visitors who come, the Sodom and Gomorrah story, uh, the story of Lot and his daughters that follow. We haven't dug into those, and there will be other things that we'll skip uh, for the sake of time. Uh, there's Abraham and Abimelech in chapter 20, where Abraham yet again lies about who Sarah is rather than choosing a different option. How easy it is sometimes to just offer a little deception rather than to move in a different way. Chapter 21 is the birth of Isaac. We talked about this a couple of uh, Sundays ago, and where Ishmael is seen um, making fun of, taunting the new young child, uh, Isaac. And so that results in Ishmael and Hagar being sent away. And then we come to chapter 22. And it is one of those climactic moments in a drama. And it just has very scant dialogue with incredibly powerful things going on. God says to Abraham, Abraham, Abraham says, here I am. God says, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I'll tell you about. And Abraham 
gets up the next morning and goes. Would you say, what? Relationship going on, things are working out. It's been about 25, 26 years since chapter 12 and God plucking them. God is shaping and training and blessing and saying, I'll give, I'll give, I'll give, I'll do, I'll do, I'll do. And then all of a sudden, here's this child and God says, oh, by the way, I want you to go stick him up above a fire and burn him till he's crisp. Would you say what? What? I wonder if you said what uh, a few years ago when this came out. This is a blizzard, and I guess it's called a royal blizzard. Um, I remember these advertised, and you you could get it with white, brown, or red goo in the middle of it. Anybody have one of these? I don't remember having one, you know, just regular ice. And, and so the commercials that came out with Dairy Queen's thing showed people eating it, and then they'd hit that core of goo, that, and then they would say, what? Would you say what with me? What? What in the world is that? And this was a delightful what. When, when you, you see something, uh, you experience something, you see somebody else that has something, and it kind of draws you in a little bit. That's what they, of course, wanted with the Dairy Queen. Uh, that, that kind of enticing, what? Would you say that again? Say what? And to me, that reminds me of how, in my experience, most people come to faith in Christ. It's by something positive that happens uh, for them, with them, around them, um, that they see. Maybe early on in their life, they sing the song. uh, Jesus loves the little children, all the little children of the world. And at some point, they realize that somebody loves them, and something in them says, say it with me, what? Maybe I want to be part of that. Maybe they sang the song, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And something says, what? It's that positive sort of what. You're kind of drawn in by it in some way. Maybe somebody's reading Psalm 139. Might be in worship, might be at home. Maybe it's not an official reading, but it, it, it has that sense where God says, I knit you together in your mother's womb, and you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Maybe that's the thing that makes the connection and causes the people or persons to say, what? I want to be part of that. Maybe it is the story of, say, the Good Samaritan, where there's somebody who's just in a horrible way, and some people ignore, but this one person, a Samaritan, goes and helps out, and and at some point it connects, and somebody says, "I, I like that. I want to be part of that. It's as if their heart was saying, what? Or maybe they heard, maybe at a football game, if those are still put up, John 3, 16, they didn't really know what it was, and they read it, and here is this incredible gift of God's graciousness. For God so loved the world, God gave his only begotten son, that we might have life through him, and what? There's something good. Most folks, I think, connect either from, from birth and up or, or somewhere afterwards with the things of God because of something that is um, captivating and encouraging. And it can be a whiz-bang experience or something slow and steady that just happens over time. And then there's difficulties that come along. We've stepped into that, that blessedness that, that we find maybe in here or maybe in God's people, and then, then we hit a difficult patch, something that is challenging for us. And we kind of scratch our heads, and the what isn't so much of a delight, but perhaps a challenge, maybe that struggle that says, what? Would you say what with me that way? What? And so maybe we've, we've been lured into this relationship with God, and we've heard about Jesus, Maybe we've even given our life, but we don't really know what that means, or or we've struggled with that. And and so we turn to the the scriptures, perhaps. Maybe we've suffered uh, death. Maybe our family has suffered divorce. Maybe there's illness in our lives. Maybe there's some sort of addiction that has come in to our families. And perhaps we're caught up 
and the strife of the day, racial strife here, or social strife here, or political stuff there, and maybe we're just kind of flabbergasted by how some of the people respond to what's going on with the virus. And, and so we go to our scriptures and, and we start to dig a little bit, wanting to, to tap into that positive what, that, that breath of God. And so maybe we go back to 139, Psalm 139, talking about being wonderfully, fearfully made, knit in our mother's womb, and we start to read on afterwards, and we come towards the end of, of that psalm, and it says, search me and try me, and see if there's any wicked way within me. And instead of saying what with a smile, we say, ooh, I don't know if I want to read that. I want to go back to that, that other part. And so maybe, maybe I just pick up my Bible and I'm, I'm thumbing through and, and, and so I thumb through over to chapter, I mean, a Matthew's gospel and I land on chapter five and there's that section that says if somebody slaps you on one cheek, you're to turn to them the other. And I say, what? Say it with me, what? <laughs> I don't know about that. So I, I flip over, I don't like that one. I flip on over, I'm, I'm in chapter 10 of Matthew's Gospel, and there's the part where Jesus says, do you think that I came to bring peace upon the earth? I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. I came, and father will be against brother, and daughter against mother, and mother-in-law against, and it goes on and on and on. Oh, no, I don't want that. That's, that causes me to say, what? So I flip on over, and maybe I flip uh, eight more chapters to chapter 18, looking for something that'll help me go, oh. And I find that part where, where Jesus says, if a brother or sister sins, go to them and confront them with their sin. And the focus is on being a blessing to them and restoring them in that special responsibility, but if I'm focused on that other thing, I'm just going to continue to flip over. That's, that's not what I want. Is it possible that I can just pick and choose what I want and, and avoid ever having to do some of those difficult things? My suspicion is, is that when Abraham hears from God about taking his son, his only son, he has been promised for 25 years, that he said, what? There had to be some conversation, but the scripture, the scripture just shows Abraham mute. Abraham has a history of talking with and even bargaining with God, but we don't find any of that here. Abraham is, is just absolutely mute. And he takes Isaac, and he takes a couple of servants with him, and they go to this land, and he takes this young boy, Isaac, old enough to carry the very wood that he's going to be burned with. He carries that. The servants stay behind. Abraham has the knife and the flint to make the fire. And as they're going along, Isaac says to him, Dad, yes, my son, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And there's that moment. That's that climactic moment in the drama. You can just imagine what music is playing in the background. Abraham's response is to say, God will provide the lamb. And then he binds him up. And we don't have any words at all from Isaac. I wonder if Abraham gagged him so he wouldn't scream or if he's just sitting there calmly trusting in dad. But he's all bound, laying on this thing. The fire is prepared and Abraham holds up the knife. And then the angel comes and says, don't do it. Cut him loose, and there's a ram, and it's passed. In the midst of it all, God is, in a sense, reaching down and saying, Abraham, do you trust me? My sense is, probably throughout all of this, God is saying to Abraham, do you, do you trust me? And oh, what a difficult thing it is to trust when there's so much on the line. How many of y'all 
like the Olympics. I think if, um, if the Olympics didn't, wasn't postponed, it'll be, this is Summer Olympics was gonna be this summer, I think we'd be just about through with it if it went on, or maybe it'd be past, but uh, next year in Japan, I think it'll happen, Summer Olympics, and I love watching the Olympics. I can just watch things I've never watched before, and I can't remember what this is called, but it's some sort of gymnastics, rhythmic gymnastics, team gymnastics, and these ladies use uh, twirly things and balls and hula hoops and, and other sorts of stuff. They operate individually, but then they have this group thing that to me is just absolutely amazing. This is a picture of, of five of them, and <clears throat> look, at, <laughs> look at how together they are. To me, this is a wonderful picture of the life of faith, that we all play an individual part, and yet God calls us to act along with God in ways that bring about things that are wonderful for our lives and for the larger kingdom. <clears throat> One of the things that I think is true about every athlete in the Olympics is that they have good, basic physical health. Their muscles and their nutrition and all of that works together, and, and they're just basically healthy. They have to be. They've done the very base level stuff, and then they have this incredible practice again and again and again and again to get things like this crisp. And to me, it's just inspiring and awesome all at the same time. God, with Abraham and Sarah, is still creating and molding this people, and we're part of that, that we would have this basic spiritual nutrition. And we can talk about that in lots of different ways. One of the ways we talk about that in church is prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness, that that's part of all of our lives, that we're strengthening that, Particularly so when God says, I want you to do this type of gymnastics or that type of something, we've got that basic level of fitness that we then begin to practice beyond to bring about a spiritual abundance, this spiritual connection that when it's difficult and God is reaching down and saying, do you trust me? that it's just a natural extension of who we are. That's the ideal. Abraham and Sarah, they struggle with that. I wonder what was going on with Abraham. Hmm. So incredible amount of practice. For us, practice looks different. I think if, if we went back to Matthew's scriptures, maybe we start at, at chapter 18 first. What would practice look like? I have a neighbor who has a lawnmower that's a bad lawnmower. It's a terrible lawnmower, and he's selling it at a garage sale that I happen to be looking at all of his stuff as I hear him characterize that broken, terrible lawnmower to somebody who's about to buy it as the best lawnmower he's ever had, and it runs like a top. My neighbor, who might be part of my church, is being deceptive in order to make some money. God is saying, trust me. Let's you and I walk through the 18th chapter of Matthew together. And I'll help you talk, too. And, and the focus is not to hold someone accountable, but to help restore them to the life of abundance that God calls us to. Do you trust me? Or if not 18, I'm going to flip back. I'm going to go back to, say, chapter 10 where God, where Jesus reminds us about this difficulty that will happen in our families if we put first the things of God. Across the street, my brother lives. He has a teenage son who stole a lawnmower. I saw it happen. I go to my brother and his wife, and I ask my nephew to come in, and I say, what's happened? What an incredibly uncomfortable moment. Particularly if they do what so often gets done of being defensive and saying it didn't happen and trying not to. 
God is saying, do you trust me? Let's walk through Matthew 10 together, and I will be with you. Do you trust me, or will you handle this in some other way? No, okay, I don't want to do that. So we flip back maybe to chapter 5, that part about turning the other cheek. My neighbor on the other side is angry with me. We don't agree about many things. He thinks I'm on the wrong side of the issues. And we happen to be out in the front yard at the same time, and he gets right in my face and is yelling at me. And he might not be striking me yet, but he's very, very aggressive and saying hurtful things. Here's this opportunity as I'm being slapped on one cheek to try to to do that other. Do you trust me? Do you trust me? God is saying uh, to us again and again. I, I wonder, I have a plan for you, Jesus says, do you trust me? It's not just about Jesus loving me, although it includes that. It's not just about Jesus loving the little children, although it includes that. It, it involves a trust that reaches beyond what's comfortable. I can only imagine how difficult it was for Abraham to trust God in putting his child in what seemed to be a place of death. And yet God will not leave us alone. So if God this day is saying to you, trust me, what is it that you're struggling with? What is it that most consumes you? What is it most that, that you need to deal with that is continuing to edge at you and get at you? What is it that you need to grasp God's hand and say, okay, let's walk together? Will you pray with me? Gracious and forgiving God, your love for us defies the imagination. How in the world over thousands of years could you continue to, to love a species that turns away from you, that is hot and cold and takes two steps forward and four steps back, and yet there you are. You not only love us, but you continue to, to draw us closer. You continue to stay connected. You continue to bring blessings. We are at times in awe of that. Speak to our hearts this day, gracious God as you know what stirs in us, what stirs in our world, what is so difficult for us to put before you and trust you in. So we seek to do that and then, and then to walk as we hold your hand and to move through what is before us as your son would in a Christ-like manner. Teach us more about how we do that. I ask all of this in the name of your Son, our Savior Jesus, and all God's people said.